Good afternoon in New York. Good evening in Ukraine, England, and Europe, Africa. And welcome whatever time of day or night for all of you who are joining us from the rest of the world. I'm Yael Danieli, founder and executive director of the International Center for the Study, Prevention, and Treatment of Multi-Generational Legacies of Trauma, ICMGLT for short. Thank you very much for joining our webinar today. <clears throat> this International Center uh, uh, for Multi-Generational Legacies of Trauma webinar is held in observance of the 20th of 26 June, the International Day in Support of Victims of Torture. Presenters from across the world will discuss inter- and multi-generational legacies of torture and related trauma and losses to victim survivors, families, and communities. Their work, the work of the Global Network of Rehabilitation Centers, and that of victim survivors themselves, as you would learn today, enhance the transition from her to healing that might in turn prevent torture's legacy from shaping the lives of succeeding generation. This webinar would not have happened if it weren't for the generosity and dedication of ICMGLT's board member and chair of the ICMGLT Working Group on Torture and Advisory, uh, Mary Fabry, and Advisory Council members, Dr. Irina Frankova, who is also chair of our Working Group on Ukraine. We are thankful as well to our wonderful English Ukraine interpreters, Yana Stembukovska and Natalia Zetz, and French English interpreters, Wendom, uh, Wisdom Donkor and Christian Nzehey. Your moderator, I am a clinical psychologist, a victimologist, traumatologist, and psychohistorian. I devoted much of my career to studying, treating, and preventing multi-generational impacts of massive trauma, to victims' rights, to reparative justice, and to articulating history as it is lived rather than as it is written about with numbers and events only. Our first speaker today is Dr. Oksana Mironenko, an orthopedic surgeon, traumatologist and volunteer. Dr. Mironenko is originally from Ukraine's Luhansk region. Escaping to Bucha in 2014, she worked at the Dobrobut Clinic in Kiev. Since March 2022, she has also been working at the hospital in Ivano Frankivsk and founded the Our Falcon Charity Fund in honor of her mother who was killed in Bucha. Our Falcon helps forcibly displaced people with limited mobility, seriously wounded soldiers and civilians, persons released from captivity, and the bereaved. Our second speaker, Dr. Ahmed Amin is a licensed medical doctor with the Iraqi Medical Association and Kurdistan Medical Association. Dr. Amin is one of the founders and the director 
of the Ukan Organization for Victims of Human Rights Violations, a national Kurdish human rights NGO that operates in Iraq, but mainly in Kurdistan region. He has been working in the field of health and human rights for over 23 years. Third is Dr. Pau Perez Salis, a psychiatrist and director of the Complutense University's postdoctoral degree in mental health in political violence and catastrophe in Madrid, Spain. Dr. Perez Salis is also affiliated with the Department of Psychiatry at Hospital La Paz and serves as director of CIRA Center for Research, Forensic Documentation and Rehabilitation of Ill Treatment and Torture Victims. Pau is the current editor-in-chief of Torture Journal, a quarterly journal on prevention and rehabilitation of torture victims. Fourth is Dear Suleiman Gwengwe, a Chadian torture victim and human rights activist who was instrumental against the former victim, Saint Hadley. From Bongor, Chad, Suleiman now please lives in Bongor. Uh, please mute yourself, dear. Thank you. Suleiman is the recipient of ICMGLT's 2003 Repair Leadership Award, quote, for emerging from hell to document and rally fellow victims to ensure that dictators are brought to justice. Last but not least, it's Suleiman's son, Jacob, who earned a bachelor in psychology from Turo University here in New York. We have two hours for the webinar. Each speaker will talk for about 10 minutes. Following an interchange among us, I will open the floor to questions and brief comments, please, from the virtual audience. Panelists will then conclude with last words. Please use the chat function and we'll do our best to respond to as many as we can. Feel free to direct your question to a particular panelist or to the full panel. This webinar could not be timelier. As you all know, we are pulsating with history. And we begin indeed with Dr. Oksana Mironenko, who is speaking to us from Kiev. Oksana, dear, the screen is yours. Thank you. I'm Oksana. I'm from Ukraine. Uh, now uh, I'm a speaker, um, uh, but uh, I will talk uh, in Ukraine about uh, psychological problems. Okay. Please speak up, dear. Oh, um, well, we are going to discuss violence, uh, which is related to the war in Ukraine. As you know, at present, we, the war is outraging in Ukraine. And unfortunately, our civil uh, representatives of the civil societies and civilians who live uh, uh, close to the front line or under the occupied territories uh, are constantly facing violence and traumas. They are traumatized. And also the military servicemen who are being captured by the Russians. And the, well, they also are become subjects of tortures and uh, they also suffer traumas. And uh, at present, uh, we can see a lot of psychological mental health issues 
issues uh, uh, with the civil population and civilians and uh, IDPs and uh, military servicemen uh, who have been affected by the war. And uh, the last war in Ukraine actually was the Second World War in Ukraine. And unfortunately, there were lots of violence in those days during those that war. And uh, it lasted for four years. And across the territory of Ukraine, well, the troops were moving. There was occupation by the Nazis, deoccupation by of, of, of the, by the Soviet government, and there were the acts of violence of which the victims uh, included women, men, and children. But the Soviet government, after the war and during the repressions of the Soviet Union, were concealing on this information about these traumas uh, at the state level, and uh, the victims' rights were never uh, defended, and uh, the, these uh, well, actually, crimes were not documented. Because uh, in Ukraine, unfortunately, the very special attitude to violence has been formed. And also the stereotypes have been developed. Uh, and the, the facts of violence are being ignored. Uh, so, well, that, uh, well, uh, it, 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 it is not being becoming public so that uh, people, you know, don't get upset. And actually, the... Oh, that is uh, uh, the situation currently, which is evolving in Ukraine, and it affects the civil population and military men, and uh, those who have uh, been victims of violence. And after they understand that, uh, after they acknowledge their problems officially, well, we, oh, well, a lot of people cannot properly perceive this situation. And at present, uh, there is a paradox uh, in our society now. There is a lot of violence, there are a lot of victims of violence, uh, but uh, the, the support to these people is quite limited. Well, I would like to explain why I'm engaged in this work. Um, uh, this is uh, the story. Why I am uh, uh, doing it. Uh, I actually, a I, doctor, I am a traumatologist and I'm from Lugansk where the war started in 2014. And uh, I just face these traumas, physical traumas uh, since then. And also I try to treat the psychological traumas as well. And also I am treating the military men who are released from the Russian uh, uh, Russian. Uh, imprisonment and also I am uh, helping the IDPs, especially those who have limited mobility. They had very difficult life uh, time and life uh, previously uh, to the situation which is evolving in Ukraine at now at present. But now the, their situation even became more acute. And also I'm now working in the project uh, which is about uh, giving assistance to the uh, victims of the sexual violence uh, during uh, the Russian aggression. There are a lot of traumas, a lot of people who are traumatized, but we have uh, successful cases of the programs. Uh, uh, and I would like to tell you how we are trying to help people uh, who are traumatized. There is quite an interesting organization. It is a patronage service, the Angel of Azov. It was uh, created when there existed Azov uh, regiment in Ukraine. And uh, this now is uh, a offensive brigade and the staff of the patronage service, and I am working with them constantly, are carrying out, in this case, the role of, you know, like the, the, uh, the guardians of the wounded military men, and uh, they are providing uh, the uh, clothes and the medicines and uh, they organize the treatment and rehabilitation is being organized if the, the very serious problems with the health emerge. So they are helping to uh, find a job for such people and they provide social support as well. So we are providing the full, so to say, complex of care about the military men who are wounded. And if the military serviceman is mobile, so the patronage service uh, organizes uh, uh, just uh, the care. 
But if, uh, well, and if the military men has been killed, so this patronage service is helping to identify the body, the relatives, they inform the relatives, and they help to organize the funeral for such individual. And uh, they uh, help not only to the military servicemen, but often uh, they help uh, to their wives and families, and sometimes the children and unborn children. Well, we had a case uh, when the uh, military serviceman was killed and the baby, his baby was born after his death. Uh, so this uh, baby and the mother were taken care of by this foundation as well. And how does it work? When uh, the military men uh, who are risking their lives uh, and understands uh, that uh, actually he is uh, helped uh, by the friends and there is a good patronage service. Uh, so they might, you know, worry less about uh, the life of their families and even their own lives. And uh, that helps them to properly, you know, fight in the front line. But uh, if uh, the traumas uh, uh, occur, well, they uh, understand that it's inevitable, it might happen. So we are providing a medical uh, treatment to them. And this medical treatment uh, usually is more effective if they are psychologically prepared for that. And you can see the pictures, uh, well, uh, and this is about evacuation of the wounded military servicemen to the hospitals. And uh, the, you can see the person who is uh, stewarding this person, and he is a representative uh, from the patronage service. And when the military men are being released uh, from the Russian uh, imprisonment, uh, so they are provided uh, the uh, clothes and food and psychological care. So well, this organization is working with the people since uh, at 2014, and the name of this organization uh, is called Shana, the Bluebird. Uh, Shana, uh, dear, uh, there's a question, uh, what is Azov? Is it a location, a person, a brigade? Uh, 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 and, uh, uh, okay, wait, 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 before you answer me, someone is saying that it is hard to, difficult to follow Ukrainian, which means you are not looking at the in in at the language interpretation because we do have interpretation to English, Jacques. So if you look at, so if you look at, uh, if you click below on interpretation and then click on English you will hear the English interpretation instead of the Ukrainian, okay? So uh, that is about the interpretation. And Oris, thank you very much for explaining that Azov is a, oops, Azov is a title of Ukrainian military regiment. Thank you, thank you so much. It's a large military, it's a large military unit. It's a just a offensive brigade, which is one of the strongest and it has a long history and uh, uh, it is uh, very famous in Ukraine. And here you can see the uh, examples of rehabilitation and socialization and uh, of the veterans uh, of the military forces. Uh, and I'd like to tell you a few words about the hospital in which I am working. It is called the first voluntary surgical hospital in the city of Ivano-Frankivsk in the Western Ukraine. It, it used to be a private clinic, which from the beginning of the war became a volunteer hospital for all the wounded military men. And the people from all over Ukraine started to, to work there. But I am uh, one of the few who stayed there and I am working there. And several days a, a week, I do uh, orthopedical surgery. It provides uh, free of charge. Uh, uh, assistance to the civilians and uh, who are wounded and uh, the military men who are wounded. And we are also working with the people who have PTSD and uh, those who have been tortured uh, um, uh, in the 
uh, Russian imprisonment. Uh, and we have a psychologist who is working several days a week and it's a routine procedure and we have psychiatrists if we need them and uh, we provide very uh, good medical services but we have uh, an excellent program for social rehabilitation which uh, is uh, taken care of by absolutely all this stuff we even have a cat who participates uh, in uh, in uh, the social rehabilitation activities and we carry out several activities uh, every week these could be the lectures the tours excursions the concerts uh, and we are uh, uh, taking our patients uh, to the uh, um, mountains uh, we visit historical sites and we actually have a lot of guests uh, who come to us uh, and our patients are talking to the children, communicating to the children, we visiting schools with them. And we carry out master classes, uh, for example, for drawing. And once a week, we actually uh, will hypotherapy. Well, we uh, give them an opportunity to ride horses every week. And they uh, communicate with people, with ourselves and the atmosphere is very, very friendly and family-like, and that helps them to rehabilitate quite uh, much more quickly. Officially, this uh, uh, hospital, uh, which provides uh, the service, the orthopedical, surgical services, but they are not only treated medically, but also psychologically. And, and this experience is quite... Uh, are quite uh, interesting and we are open to share our experience uh, so if uh, well for example uh, you need more uh, information about that so well i'm ready to share my experience with those who are interested we also have a charity fund our falcon i have founded it to commemorate my mother at the beginning, it was just the foundation which provided various charity activities. But then we started to concentrate on the assistance to the IDPs with the low mobility. And well, we were accepting these people. And now we take care about these people. We have become, uh, you know, like caretakers of them. Uh, we provide them with food, but if they uh, live in the separate apartments, we also bring food to them. We provide medicines and help them to be medically treated. And we also uh, have them uh, to, uh, uh, you know, uh, to renew their documents and their status. And unfortunately, among them, they're mostly uh, aged people and uh, their health is very fragile. But also, there is also a problem uh, of the people who come uh, from the eastern part of Ukraine to the western part of Ukraine, mm, actually, mm, they, mm, they, they actually, it was very difficult for them to, to, to get transferred there because it's a long way to do there. And uh, unfortunately, the conditions, uh, the absolutely new conditions in which they find ourselves, we have a lot of cases of psychological disorders and mental disorders, that, which become much more acute due to these long trips and new conditions under which they live. And sometimes we even have to call psychiatrists and some patients of this kind are placed into the psychiatric clinics. We also help uh, the... Uh, military servicemen uh, and we provide psychological support uh, and we also provide a lot of uh, pharmaceuticals uh, and uh, mm, we also take care of the military men who are in the front line and uh, they uh, are receiving a uh, high quality medications uh, and pharmaceuticals from us and uh, we are explaining how to to use these medicines uh, and also they are usually a uh, very are very uh, grateful for the care we are providing them. And also we arrange information campaigns about the problems of the military men, because people who do not see these people every day, they don't know how you know serious these problems are. Well, like for example, today we have evacuated two women from the front line and they are elderly people. And actually they, uh, they, 
uh, their health is very fragile. They are trying um, to get away from the hospital. They want to live uh, in their private homes. Uh, and uh, quite often they arrange, uh, well, uh, well, we are trying to work also with the personnel of the clinics uh, so that they would be uh, more attentive to such patients. So we are trying to uh, arrange good communication between the patients and the personnel. And uh, well, uh, and uh, quite often we have to reconcile uh, these people who might, uh, you know, have uh, difficulties with dealing with each other. And this is the picture which shows us how we are evacuating such patients. And you can see that they are stressed and uh, uh, they they have different difficulties uh, in uh, mobility. But we are constantly are trying to communicate with them, and this is how they are being evacuated. And uh, this is actually an awful process, an awful procedure, but this is uh, the war. And we have also a very successful project and uh, it's uh, the, uh, the uh, organization of the civil society. It was founded by the women who have become the uh, victims uh, of the sexual uh, abuse uh, in the occupied territories. But uh, now they are uh, trying to help women who uh, have become victims thereof, and and they also and they also are using the services of the psychologists. And I am working in this project. As I am working as a consultant. We actually uh, uh, provide medical medical treatment for these patients, and also we are doing everything possible to restore their mental health so that people will be able to continue uh, working and uh, uh, the victims of, uh, if the victims of uh, social abuse are not uh, receiving high quality treatment, uh, well, they, they are, it will be very difficult uh, to continue uh, working and uh, living. So we are engaged in medicine and also we cover social issues to recover documents. And usually people come just with a package of something, just a small package of belongings and nothing else. This project, we are now working on it. And this is one of the, of the examples. There was a massive liberation of uh, women who were held captive some for years. And here, this is one of the founders of the initiative. So we are in touch. We communicate with the traumatized people, survivors. We try to avoid using the word victim because that may aggravate the issue. We more often communicate mostly those who have their individual experience of occupation or who were subject to violence. I deal with the medical part and I usually provide mostly kind of technical assistance to people. And now my conclusions. We have a lot of people here who suffer traumatization now this is the entire country and people have a lot of psychological issues so we need a lot of specialists from the military social trauma psychology and the psychology to overcome consequences of violence unfortunately so far we don't have that many professionals because we have only among the military, we have one and a half million who need assistance. And of course, when people are in hospitals where there are sometimes civilians and the military in the same ward, and they are talking to a psychotherapist can hardly be held individually. And in this way, we have to postpone the care and assistance. And uh, that is why I uh, borrowed this term, free psychological care, 
because there is free medical care and uh, there are training courses and uh, that's cool, that's very popular. But in practice, when somebody suffers stress, violence, while they're waiting for a professional to come and help them, a lot of time may pass and the situation goes critical. So the situation of providing free psychological help before a professional psychologist comes, I believe that the skills need to be developed by all employees of hospitals, from nurses to doctors to professionals, workers of social um, events, and uh, also the education educators who often shelter these people. So teaching people to be kind and sensitive, empathic, so that it were possible to provide assistance to the other. This is a skill needed for all the Ukrainians. And this is what we are now gaining. Mostly we are doing that now by means of self-education and also professionals try to at least share some basic experience, basic skills. And finally, they have launched a, a national program and we really hope that it will be efficient and that uh, Ukraine will not only prevail in the war, but we will also overcome the huge psychological crisis that now we are facing. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for inviting me to the conference. I'm ready to answer your questions based on our experience. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Oksana. Uh, you're such a brave, a brave woman. Uh, uh, thank you for your concept of pre-psychological care. We will we will uh, check it out later on in our dialogue. <laughs> I am very excited about it. So is Irina, Dr. Frankova. Uh, you can see. Uh, I, there's so much to discuss. There's so much to discuss. Uh, thank you for describing such a holistic, multi-dimensional uh, perspective, uh, which is so very important. Um, uh, and and all of the governments and people around the world who are trying to raise funds to rebuild Ukraine should also remember, as I tell them every time I can, that you need to rebuild the people too. So you need also the funding for psychological and psychosocial support, uh, not only to rebuild buildings. Uh, uh, we will come with other questions later, and the floor is now yours, Ahmed or Dr. Amin. It's a pleasure to, to have you with us. Thank you so much, Dr. Daniri, and uh, thank you so much, Oksana, for the nice presentation. I will talk about now you are in the, in the, the situation, the trauma situation. And uh, Dr. Danelli told me that uh, to talk about the intergenerational trauma, that trauma might transfer to generation. And that's uh, what I'm talking about. Uh, Dr. Danelli, can I share the screen from my side or, or it's from your side? It's absolutely up to you. Why don't you try? And, okay, and I will try. That's from my side. Okay. Here we go. Perfect. Yeah. We have it. Thank so you so much. Few slides just about the organization that, uh, thankfully, Dr. Danelli uh, introduced me that I'm one of the founder and director of Wuchan organization. Actually, Wuchan is a Kurdish word mean rest after severe tiredness for victims of human rights violation. We have a, a, a trauma rehabilitation and training center in Suleimani, a governorate of Northern Iraq or Kurdistan region of Iraq established since 2007. But the, uh, uh, the could you do it as a full screen so we can see so we can see the the slide very clearly? 
Can you see it Perfect. now? Thank you okay. so much. Thank, Thank you. you. We have been working with trauma survivor, particularly torture survivor since late 2004 with Dr. Marie Fabri. And actually we first dealt with survivors of torture that belong to previous Iraqi regime that they have been tortured since 70s and 80s. And the effect of trauma based on uh, several articles or evidence that it could lead to uh, uh, complain extreme sadness, hopelessness, guilt, loss of interest in former pleasure activities. So symptoms of depression, mainly anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder. The effects on person uh, who are combatant, and I, I was very glad that uh, uh, Oksana talked about not just caring about the, the combatant, caring about the people as well, families because combatant might have be affected, but the civilian, if affected, they have more rates of, 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 of mental health disorders based on uh, several evidence or articles. And the intergenerational transmission of trauma, uh, I believe the word uh, came first uh, by a, a Canadian or Canadian clinicians back to 1969s that they, they, they uh, observe some behaviors among children of survivors of Nazis at that time. And they thought about it that it's a, it, tra trauma can be transmitted through the generation. Now there are several terms to use, secondary traumatization, secondary traumatic stress, uh, co-victimization, co or even they call it sometimes parental transmission because it could be transferred from parents to, to, to uh, siblings. Uh, what's important that uh, uh, now Ukraine is in the situation of, the, of, of, of trauma is how to prevent, unfortunately, we cannot prevent war. War happening for some crazy reasons. Torture is happening in many, many countries despite uh, UN uh, comb uh, combating that despite every nation that uh, talking about uh, prevention of torture, but unfortunately still in more than 100 or 150 countries are happening. So what we can do as NGOs, as professional or as actors, stakeholders dealing with survivors of trauma or torture to prevent further damage, to prevent further damage to the person and their family, as well as to siblings or to, to uh, next generation. One of the things is to, for, for, for the uh, survivors to care about survivors. The caring is physical, is very important. And Dr. Roxana is orthopedic surgeon, which is very good, but she also acknowledged that. Psychological caring is, is also important because wound, physical wound might be healed within days, weeks, years. Psychological remain. That's why we need to combine both uh, as well as uh, uh, concentrate on psychological rehabilitation. Uh, one of the, although when we, we talk about intergenerational transmission of trauma, uh, we cannot find one answer why it can be transferred, but there are some theories or models. I just brought two models. One of them saying similar to other diseases, similar to other diseases, trauma can be transferred based on biological. So it's hereditary can transfer it. The second one, which is we observe in our, our, our uh, survivors that it, it's called socialization, that model of socialization focus on uh, how parents behave, their behavior are reflected in the kids' uh, uh, behavior as well. For example, a trauma survivor parent give their kids warning that, for example, these are, I put these code, do not trust anyone, be careful. One must cannot rely on anyone outside their family. These messages, messages left their marks on their children as well. And the exaggerated worries from anxious father or, or mother or parents may convey a sense of impending danger that the child has to absorb. 
and uh, in the end, their complex or compulsive anxiety tend to be transmitted to their children. This model, we can see, that's why I put our, our experiences, we can see among survivors, kids, that those parents that they give meaning to what they pass through, uh reflect on what what their kids are also behaving feeling and thinking for example we have survivors combatant they were fighters back to 70s and uh, 80s against previous regime they have been jailed and tortured for eight years or more but they give a meaning to to that they are saying still we are proud yes we have been tortured but we have been tortured for an aim that's why uh, no, I, I don't have any symptoms. But for others, some others that they feel that they were victim, they didn't deserve to be in jail, they do, didn't deserve to be in trauma. Particularly, we have uh, the uh, 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 genocide families in one areas in, in Kurdistan. Unfortunately, they have been massacred, genocide, one, eight, 182,000 individuals being uh, taken by previous regime, they separated men from women, and they killed men and uh, women and kids left. These women and kids, they have severe symptoms of, of, of uh, depression, anxiety, and PTSD. Uh, the problem is, uh, I acknowledge and I, I, I want to stress on what uh, Oksana said. Yes, they need to be rehabilitated and they need to be acknowledged that when what they pass through is not their guilt and they should be compensated. When we are talking about compensation, it's not just uh, um, monetary wide, money compensation. No, they should be for example, these soldiers should be treated as they are heroes. They have been fighting against uh, an enemy or uh, for, for their nation. These kind of uh, compensation or rehabilitation give meaning to what they pass through. And that's th that meaning they, they, it gives to the person, the survivors, uh, a meaning to uh, live a life that uh, he feels that he's proud of what he has done. He's a survivor and not victim. Based on the theory of, of socialization, these feelings can be transferred to their, their, their kids as well. That's why um, among our survivors, those kids that they feel their father or mothers, that they have been, uh, let's say, uh, given a certificate by government, by their political parties, uh, some of them, they have been, uh, uh, they have been uh, called for interview many times. The kids feel that they are proud that even their, their parents passed through trauma, but still they are proud that uh, they have such parents. And th this gives a meaning to them. That's why we can, the, the trauma survivor or the trauma symptoms are much less among those kids. Finally, I want to say just one of our clinical supervisors conducted or conducted uh, his final thesis, master's thesis was on uh, comparing between kids of trauma survivors and kids of ordinary people, non-trauma survivors. And he found that yes, there's a moderate uh, difference or moderate symptoms among kids of, of trauma survivors compared to kids or children of uh, non-trauma survivors, which, uh, which uh, strengthened the, 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 the socialization theory. And uh, that's, uh, that's why I'm saying we need to prevent further socialization by rehabilitating torture survivors and their families. Thank you so much. I think I have 10 minutes. And uh, if you have any questions, I will be more than ready to answer. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much, Ahmed. Uh, I'd like you and, uh, and maybe for everyone, you know, this book uh, I did in 1998. It's the International Handbook of Multi-Generational Legacies of Trauma that covers 30 populations around the world. 
Uh, it's been a resource, uh, of course, it's in our library, it's in the library of the center. Uh, uh, so please, everyone feel very free to use it. And also what you'll find on our website uh, is what's called the Danielli Inventory for Multi-Generational Legacies of Trauma, uh, which is the uh, the, the the one database scientifically valid instrument to assess uh, intergenerational and multi-generational le legacies of trauma. It exists in many languages, as you can see on the website, including Arabic, including your, your well, the Ukrainian we're working on, uh, and and we will have it. Actually, for those of you who are interested in the full picture of what we found out about uh, through the measure uh, with, for example, uh, Nazi Holocaust survivors' children in Israel and in North America, uh, they, they, on, on our website, there is a special webinar where actually I'm being interviewed by the Normandy uh, Institute of Peace, and it exists both in English and in French for, for those of you interested. But uh, I'm particularly excited about the thesis you, you just reported. Uh, Ahmed, I would like a copy of it if possible. We should have it in our library. Our library has all of these findings. That's where it should be. This is excellent. Uh, and we can, of course, talk a lot more about it. Uh, God, every presentation is amazing, and I'm sure <laughs> Pao, Pao will not disappoint either. <laughs> Pao, I, we are all looking forward very much uh, to hearing your presentation. Um, what, you what, a, what a panel we have. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. It's an honor being with all of you today here. Uh, I will talk about the experience in Spain, and it's fascinating because uh, Oksana was sharing an experience where trauma is happening now. Uh, Ahmed, about the consequences in the first generation, and I will talk about the context in which we will see the consequences in the second and third generation. So I think that all the presentations are, uh, they complement uh, each other perfectly. I will share my screen. Okay, here we talk about um, the so-called transitional process in to democracy in Spain. Um, can you see the slides? Uh, yeah, we are in the second slide. Okay, perfectly. Okay, um, in Spain there was uh, a republic. Uh, there were social movements in the 30s that very much advanced to that uh, epoch. There were advancement in women's rights in the educational system, in rights of workers and peasants, and there was a certain air of revolution. During those years, uh, there was a hope, a global hope, that Spain could be a different country where democracy could reach high levels. But in 1936, there was a military coup d'etat against the constitutional forces of the Spanish Republic. The official version describes that as a civil war, but it was not a civil war. The military regime created a rhetoric of a quick war that liberated the country from leftists, from communist anarchists and the like, where all parts were equally responsible and committed crimes. But that's not true. This is part of the history. This is the history of the winners. During the war, according to traditions, because there has never been a truth commission of the Spanish Civil War, 
According to conservative estimates, in the three years of the war, from 36 to 39, the fascist army killed around 300,000 civilians in the front and around 200,000 in the areas under their control. So there was massive, a great number of extrajudicial killings of executions. There was a cleansing operation of communist, socialist, and anarchists where everybody could be targeted. Simply your neighbor give your name and there was enough for being killed. So during many months, the army went to capture people in the morning and executed them, usually in the walls of the cemeteries. Nowadays, there are still around 125,000 people disappeared in Spain, according to the organizations of victims. If you make an estimate comparing Spain with Chile, with the Pinochet dictatorships, the RETIC report, which is one of the truth uh, reports in Chile, talk about 1,200 people disappeared in Chile. Extrapolated to Spain, it would mean that five times more people were executed or disappeared in Spain. So the Franco's army conquered by blood the country. There were massive bombings of big towns, Madrid, Barcelona, and Malaga. And in some cases, entire villages were destroyed. The Picasso Guernica picture is the representation of the bombing of that town and the complete destroying of that town. A preliminary census has identified 2,300 mass graves all around the country, from five to more than 200 persons in those graves. There is just one massive grave in Valencia Cemetery where the forensic studies have identified around 10,000 corpses of people who were trying to escape through the sea from the progression of the fascist army. So less than 20% of all the people who are in mass graves have been exhumated. Why? Because there is no political will to do exhumations. All exhumations are done by private initiative of the organizations of victims. There are more than 120 small organizations all around the country, very small, and usually organized around the exhumation in their area, in the geographical area. Forensic anthropologists and psychosocial accompaniment work pro bono. And there is no legal process. The remains of the victims are considered historical remains. The bones of those that were killed are treated in the same way as if they were ancient Roman coins. No judge is present, no collection of proof, no documentation of crimes, unless the organizations try to do it at their best. So that's one of the many mass graves that are being exhumated in the last 20 years due to the voluntary work of forensic anthropologists and the survivors and the second generation of of those that were executed. When asked in 2014 about the possibility of a truth commission of the crimes of Frankism, President Mariano Rajoy answered smiling, truth commissions are for banana republics. This is Europe. Don't pretend to have a truth commission in a European country. So, uh, this was during the war, but after the war, there was a, a repression for a, a, all the time the dictatorship lasted. In the first years, there were around 1 million people in prisons. According to official figures from the regime, 200,000 died in prison, and there were around 800 concentration camps all around the country where allegedly communist prisoners underwent torture and re-education of their evil mind. Psychiatrists, I must say, I'm a psychiatrist, psychiatrists were instrumental in designing the process of re-education. Today they're saying socialist and communist women were especially vicious and very difficult to re-educate into women who respected moral principles and religion. So this is 
five years after the end of the war. And this is just as an example, certificate of proper behavior for a, a, it's a 18 years uh, boy. And he promises not doing any political activities and being loyal to the national movement. This is 1954. So it's uh, six years after ending the war. The dictatorship remained for 40 years and ended when Franco peacefully died in his bed in 1978. And the repression lasted during all the dictatorship. Those are the last executions. Just two years before Franco died, they were accused of being terrorists and killing a policeman and they were executed in 1976. So that's the situation and what has happened? Transitional justice after a coup d'etat and 40 years of military dictatorship. One, no truth, no truth commission. Victims are not recognized. There is a law that uh, allows them if they prove they have been a victim to have some kind of diploma or something like that, that doesn't mean anything really in legal terms or it means no reparation at all. There was an amnesty law in 1978 that uh, uh, impedes any kind of justice process. All the process that uh, we are trying to conduct against the perpetrators, some of the torturers in the last uh, decade of the, of the Franco regime are still alive, are dismissed in court according to the amnesty law. Of course, there is no rehabilitation. Of course, there is no reparation and guarantees of no repetition have never been discussed. So the transition means simply looking to another side and making as if nothing had happened. This is in Spanish, but basically what it says is that the law for victims of the Frankism will not allow the publication of the name of the bachelors, of the perpetrators, and all information will be closed for 50 years. So what does it mean in terms of transgenerational trauma? What does it mean? First, there is a first generation of war and post-war dictatorship in which probably the most salient element is fear and silence. There is an official history that denies what has happened, that presents the dictatorship as a kind of soft dictatorship and presents evil things doing by both sides. So there is the silence of suffering and the suffering in silence of that generation. And there is fear. Nothing is told at home, nothing is told to your offsprings or to the family. And torture, prison, executions are something that is hidden and part of family secrets. Then the, there is the second generation, the sons, 1955, 1975, when, when there is the end uh, of the dictatorship. Here, there is a pact of silence and oblivion among all political parties. There is the amnesty law, in 1978, and there is, you know, this tension between justice and uh, those messages of fear that violence could come back, that the military could make another coup d'etat, that it's better to close that uh, process. And this means that there is frustration and there is a loss of meaning and identity. So that second generation, I would say it's a frustrated generation. There were big expectations that after the dictatorship, a new time would come. But in fact, the dreams of a new society never were true. So Guans never were never here. So uh, this is the new world, something that uh, it's difficult to understand. The Socialist Party created paramilitary groups to defeat ETA, you know, the terrorist uh, Basque group we had in Spain. or the Socialist Party dismantled the labor organizations or introduced the Spain into NATO, into military 
or fostered private business. It was like crazy. Those that were the hope were the ones that exactly did the opposite that they uh, promised to do. So there was a disappointment. And in terms of, of uh, sociolo sociological impact, there is an hedonistic and empty generation, a neoliberalism as a religion. So the youth doesn't want to participate in political activity, doesn't want to be involved in social movements, and, and they prefer to resort to their own private hedonistic uh, aims and objectives in life. So if not, at the end, there are center right, center left technocratic governments that protect the status quo and human right violations and use of prison and torture, because if you don't remember what happened, you will reproduce in the future what happened. And there is the third generation, grandchildren, great grandchildren, who are trying to uncover the past and find an evident, because they are the ones that somehow accuse their parents to be cowards or not to be, you know, to have the courage to, to face what happened. And they are trying to uncover the past and to find, to, to uh, fill this gap. And here there is different big social movements that have been happening during the last 20 years. Conscious objectors that uh, made an end to the forced military service all the movement of exhumation of mass graves and the memorialistic movement, the 15M citizen revolution, a popular movement that tried to, to uh, uh, let's say, introduce changes in the, um, in the social system, questioning the, the parliamentary system and the way that the political parties uh, shared power among themselves. The platforms to protect housing rights that has been very powerful in Spain, et cetera. So, there are a lot of movements that are trying to, to have some uh, personality, but there are red lines that cannot be crossed. The amnesty law is a red line, and there are still limits to the freedom of expression and to the right to protest. So, which are the consequences of this lack of memory and identity? One, still many people have the theory of the two evils, as far as you have not explained the history in schools, there has not been a pedagogic work in schools, then you can still sustain that theory of the two evils. So this is a, a, a way of sharing responsibilities that absolutely doesn't correspond to what happened in, in those years. There is absolute impunity. So the useless attempts to judge torturers always find with the same answers from the courts, the torture has, there's a prescription of the, of the torture, there is the amnesty law, but torture was not in the penal code at that time, which of course is false because torture is an international crime that cannot prescribe and that cannot be uh, covered by any amnesty law as the Committee Against Torture has reminded once and again to the Spanish government. And we have a shame. Argentina is trying to prosecute some Spanish torturers according to international jurisdiction, which somehow should shame the Spanish politicians. And I would say that there are limits to how a society can think themselves. So the constitution, the Spanish constitution makes it impossible to question the monarchy, to allow referendums or to change, to think on a change of economical model there are still... uh, do you mean the word thing how society can think no it's... no it's 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 a mistake it's think not think yeah <laughs> thanks <laughs> thanks for the, <laughs> for the correction <laughs> okay so today there is there are still restrictions to the right of demonstration and gathering there is the called law of public security that gives uh, uh, strong restrictions to that Torture somehow never ended. We document every year at least three, 400 cases of ill treatment in detention centers, in, uh, in the penitentiary system, in demonstrations and so on. Still solitary confinement is used in prisons or migrants are deported in the border with being given the claim for asylum. I think that all those things would never happen, probably, if 
we were in a context where we were able to acknowledge our past and to deal with it. And perhaps one of the most severe consequences, the search of a neo-fascist political party, Vox, that in the last elections had a 15% of votes that embrace Franklin's ideology. A, a party which is ultranationalist that is negationist of the crimes of the dictatorship. They call a liberation war that oppose any law against gender violence who are homophobic and transphobic, who want to forbid abortion, who defend full privatization of health and education, or who have a hate discourse against migrants and refugees. And they have 15% of votes. And this probably would not have happened if there wasn't this lack of memory and this lack of identity in the second generation. So I will let it here for now. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very, very much. And thank you for adding more dimensions for the discussion, <laughs> be it the social, the political, the, the one of what uh, in my writings I call the conspiracy of silence. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and privately, now it's not private anymore. I call neo fascism, you know, the intergenerational revenge. If we don't heal, we go back and keep trying to heal. Absolutely. It's like repetition compulsion, except it takes another generation and another generation and another. Ah, Suleiman, my dear, dear, dear Suleiman, please join us and please speak for us, speak to us about your experiences. My name is Suleiman Gengeng. Geng. I am a survivor of torture, of is an abrased regime. The torture is a crime against impunity. As far as I am concerned, the, con or the outcome of this trial is of par paramount importance. Abrace condemnation made the rejection of impunity and the celebration of the value of man created in God's image. It also made that men are born equal and no man has the right to abuse his neighbor regardless of his class or rank in society. It also decided to put into practice what my father told me. My child, if you are right, don't give in and don't be afraid today. Those who are afraid today will all die before you. My confidence rested in my Christian fight, shared with that of some of my colleagues, and which was our unfailing refuge during this 27 year strength. Thus, our everyday motto was from Romy 831 If God is for us, who will be against us? In light of the above, my colleague and I were motivated to take the initiative to organize our service into an association to uh, so as to fight for justice. My honor, my dignity, and my wealth are story one I testify before the court of extraordinary extraordinary African Chamber EAC. 
No one could imagine that ordinary citizen like us could put a former president in jail. The satisfaction was absolute. For me, being able to express myself and testify before Abre was the best remedy what I needed to have and be definitely cured of all of all the harm that the deeds have inflicted on me for two and a half years. My testimony was very moving to the point of prompting Red Brody to exclaim. It was the happiest day of my life to hear Suleiman testimony. The women victims were also very courageous. They defied the uh, taboo of our society and their to denounce the sexual violence to which they were subjected. Those who have never lived an experience similar to our will never understand this feeling, the feeling of regaining one's respect and dignity. Abreistre is a precedent that should serve as a lesson for all Africa head of state in power. Let them know that they are not above the law and sooner of later they must be held accountable for their action one day leave power. To the citizen of country where dictatory reign, these people must also understand that they were the ones who chose this leader so that they might serve them and not destroy them. Finally, some thought about the role of external actors in victims' strength for justice. I have attended many conferences and seminaries where I have had the opportunity to meet several victims from different contexts and their organization. Hello everyone, my name is Koichi Jacob Genge and I'm an entrepreneur, bachelor in psychology from Turo College and member of Suleiman Genge Foundation and ICM JLT organization. I'm an indirect victim of torture from the reign of Senabri in the Republic of Chad in Central Africa. Today, I will be talking to you what has it been like to grow up in the environment that has a trauma person, family and friends, and what lesson I have learned. Trauma is defined as uh, the lasting emotional response that often results from living through a distressing event. I was born after my father while he was in prison for a false accusation from the regime of San Abri. From a born without a dad, I met my dad one year later when he came out of jail. I was one year old. He came out of prison, so his skin working as a skeleton from the torture in the detention. As, as a child, I was so scared to approach him and didn't even know that at that time that he was my father because I was born after his imprisonment. I 
As a newborn, I didn't get a father love until I was one year old. It took me time as a child to accept him. I was closer to my mom than to my dad. The relationship with my dad, sibling, and all uh, healed up by the time while we was living all together in the same house as a Thai family. I couldn't talk about my dad without telling you how many times my mom has suffered with my six older siblings plus pregnancy. She was pregnant of me, which she managed all alone. She was abandoned by some of our long lasting friends and certain family member of my father's side, while other her love at her because of the situation of struggle. But she only had God as a protector and to him alone she confided. It was a very difficult time for her. She had to feed six children and some cousins in the family in her father household on her ch child and only her by herself. If she wasn't courageous, she could be depressed and miscarry the pregnancy. The past it all, she held on right up to the end until my dad came out of jail. For me, she's always been a role model and an advisor in this situation. She never took all this situation negatively and thought as right way and she never wanted vengeance. May God grant her long, last, uh, long life. My father is a very strong person, very brave. He built up the mind of sin. He took his time to acknowledge the event, his days in prison and the torture that he suffered. He accepts support from family and friends. He practiced self-care. He is a very religious person. He is, he is never separate himself from his God uh, from the day he was in prison until he got released. He practiced mindfulness and meditation. Every day he would pray before going to sleep and would do something fun and creative every day with the family and friends until he got back on his feet and got back to routine and professional life. Aside from my own experience and that of my father, I had like you to remember that trauma takes the form of violence, whether physical or moral, and affect the life of family. It causes serious physical and mental damage to parents and children alike. Its effect management by victim and organization can give victim a little hope of starting a new life. Otherwise, some victim of trauma may become depressed and no longer be able to ensure the children have the better fortune. Order to escape the trauma, are forced to sink into a drug and alcohol. I would like to take this opportunity to thank God for having given me a father worthy of the name who, despite the torture he still remember, was able to provide good education to us offspring who do not want a father, moral children, in short, a human being to suffer the same fate. In, sh in short, I will conclude that we should take life uh, worldwide. People struggle to know what to do to support uh, people with trauma. In that case, we should feel free to be honest, vulnerable, and courage the love the loved one to take the lead to her heal. I should, it should be with the love of our family and friends that surrounding us, life can be made beautiful, life can be more beautiful and purposeful by discharging our duty in our family, at work, society, vulnerable, encourage the love, the loved one to take the lead to her heal. 
I should, it should be with the love of our family and friends that surround us. Life can be made beautiful. Life can be more beautiful and purposeful by discharging our duty in our family, at work, society, and world at large. To conclude uh, my remark, I would like to ask you who are present here today to help anyone regardless of race, ethnicity, culture, or religious who find themselves in, the, in this situation. Let's work together hand in hand to help people in danger out of the situation and give them back the hope. Thank you for your attention. But we are together internationally, which is the good part. Uh, I was wondering whether, it, among all of you, you spoke about physical health and mental health and psychosocial health and the absence of justice and the achievement of justice. Uh, you've spoken about so many of the crucial dimensions after trauma in general and torture in particular. Uh, I was wondering whether you have uh, questions of each other or comments on each other's presentation. Uh, and, and that is be before we go to questions from the audience. Please unmute yourself and speak freely. Paul, uh, Suleiman, Jacob, Oksana, Ahmed. or any comments, any feelings, because I'm feeling quite overwhelmed, not only the technical difficulties, that's just the last straw in the camel back, but the amount of pain and the amount of trauma and the amount of injustice that we've been sharing among ourselves uh, from so many different situations. Um, I, uh, please, Oksana. Yes, Oksana. I would like to thank everyone for your great presentations. And I uh, took notes, actually, when I was listening to your reports. And I understand now that all over the world, uh, there were there were events uh, which uh, which entail tortures of people and actually somehow somehow these things persist in the world and the people torture each other and the statistics uh, uh, well are the same all over the world when the war starts and uh, uh, the statistics of victims uh, is huge. And uh, the question of uh, satisfaction, the question of uh, um, you know, acknowledging these things and punishing these things uh, is not resolved. And up to the present, uh, people actually do not understand how difficult it is to be a victim of uh, tortures and quite often this is stigmatized being traumatized or person who was tortured uh, quite often uh, is stigmatized and it is very difficult to get a recourse on these cases and actually to get satisfaction or to get the uh, reparation uh, be it pecuniary or moral it's very difficult to get. And I think that this issue has to be raised on the global level. And if we share our experience at the international events, the conferences, exactly. the webinars, maybe it will be yeah, able, exactly. we will be able to make more people aware about it and give an opportunity to those who suffer to give them hope and faith and support. And they will be able to actually bring up their questions uh, to apply to the specialists, uh, to the friends, uh, to professionals and non-professionals as well. And maybe the uh, level of suffering is going to decrease because any trauma during the war 
uh, has consequences and uh, there are consequences for the next generation. I have my personal experience. My grand grandmother and grand grandfather uh, were in the Russian concentration camps uh, due to the political beliefs and ethnical position. And in my family, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, there was a lot of experience uh, and my uh, uh, grandfather was a heroic person, but it was impossible to discuss all these things outside the family. And maybe because of this, uh, I am working on uh, providing assistance to everyone who is traumatized. I know what it was like. I know that a lot of these things were concealed from me. And, uh, they, uh, and, uh, but, um, uh, this was discussed, but I was, they were not engaging me in these discussions. But now I'm not afraid to bring up these uh, issues and uh, I am not afraid to uh, inform people on these things. So thank you very much and let us unite in our efforts. Right, and that's what the center is for, exactly. That's what we are here for, to, 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 to teach each other about each other and create the network that will not be afraid and will speak uh, and will teach. Uh, so we are hearing you and Pao maybe Maybe uh, it's time to, to have a special issue of the journal about intergenerational transmission. Uh, so use not only the webinar, but the journal. And while we were listening to each other, I was thinking we have to have an international conference, not just webinars, because I, I'm feeling frustrated that I cannot give you a hug somehow uh, and share more of the feelings. And on the chat too, uh, people, Rita is talking about, of course, other places in Armenia and, uh, and, and Gilbert is talking about Rwanda. And if you look at our website, we have a webinar on each one of these. And we keep having webinars on each one of these. That's the point. But uh, and to make sure that the world will learn whether they like it or not. The Pao, what you brought up is that in Spain, uh, silence was built into law, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, which is a different situation than social silence, right? Or family silence. Uh, so, so. Uh, you know, I did my doctorate many years ago on what I call the conspiracy of silence after the Holocaust. And you're st we are still talking about it, so, but we keep, we have to keep going. There's just no other choice, is there? Uh, yeah. So Paul, would you, maybe we can speak about the silent dimension. I, I see Ahmed, you were, you were talking with your head, please, and Paul, to you too. Go ahead. Well, I think that um, oh. <laughs> it's, sad, it's sad to say that um, we seem to be discovering. Could you speak to the mic? Sorry. Yeah, we, we seem to be discovering once and again what we uh, already know from other experiences. I'm just thinking on uh, uh, Latin America, where they are now conducting big studies on transgenerational trauma. And uh, for instance, in, in Chile, they, they have an official program, the prize program for survivors of torture. And the program was intended for the first generation. But um, after uh, 10 uh, years, um, they realized that it was impossible to close the program. They had to prolong it because there was a second generation. And now um, they, they see that they also must cover the third generation. And uh, some people are saying that the program will have to, to remain uh, probably for many, many years uh, because you can trace the impacts at the, at the community level and the family level and the individual level uh, even farther than the third generation. And it's something that, that we already knew, but it seems that, that uh, we have to rediscover again. And to me, um, Obviously, we already knew that truth 
has a healing value. And, uh, and uh, when you uh, do not have uh, some kind of official recognition of what happened, mm -hmm. uh, this is this damage people because it's like uh, your experience is not validated. You have to show that to prove that what you suffered is true. And this is incredible damaging for people. So uh, the truth, it's, it's important and the justice is important. This is something we should know. And once and again, we go to the same debates in uh, with the politicians whether or not this could be assumed so i think that your work is really important and i'm happy to offer the tour to the journal for a special section because i think that it's always time to remember and to to uh, go back to this absolutely important topics um because you see the experience in ukraine uh, again the same discussion so Thanks. Absolutely. And you were you were mentioning identity before. This is not only about a series of symptoms, uh, be it whatever diagnosis we, we throw. It is about who am I? Who is my family? Who are my children? Who is my society? Who is my nation? Go ahead, Ahmed. I think you have a lot to say. Yeah, just to echo or add what Pa was saying, the silence gives a denial, kind of denial what happened to survivors, which is, which is not a healing uh, situation, not a healing way. And that's why I saw in the chat, yeah, people talking about Armenia or, or other, other contexts. And unfortunately, what we hear from Pa, uh, it was not on a cultural level, because sometimes the uh, families, we don't want to talk because we feel that still we are in danger. But when it, it comes to political level, government know the silence should be break. Otherwise, there will be no healing process. And we all know, the, the, the rehabilitation centers know that uh, disclosures are the, 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 the principles of healing. And we hope that uh, government acknowledge, successor government acknowledge that silence or denial or bury what happened is a not, it's not a healing process. It's traumatizing. And since in sim this webinar we are talking about transgeneration, it leads to trauma of other generations, not just a person, him or herself, herself suffer. No, families, transgeneration will, 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 will suffer again. Thank you. And many of the indigenous people believe that it goes to seven generations. And, and identity is at, the, but, uh, is at the base of it. And we have colleagues from, from uh, Bosnia on, in, in the audience too and saying us too. And we are having, we do have webinars on that. Uh, there was a question to, to you, but uh, Oksana, but I'm sure to all of you, it's an anonymous question uh, about rape. Uh, can you briefly, please briefly, because that's a whole other crucial webinar. And we do have some of the webinars on the website on that. Would you want to comment on that briefly? Either Oksana or Ahmed or Carol. I don't or, see, or I don't see this question so far. Um, question about rape. Yes. I, women, uh, women who were raped as part of torture. All of us know too well about that. Yeah. Well, actually, this is a very challenging question. And uh, it is hushed down. It is not being discussed externally as well. Sometimes we do manage to uh, organize it that survivors can talk to professionals. And also in our practice, we see a lot of cases of rapes of minor uh, children, unfortunately. My second uh, hometown, Bucha, 
there were about, I believe, 200 complaints uh, about rape uh, from minors after one month of occupation. And these are the ones who, who have survived and who managed to speak about that because the society labels these people and these people become ostracized. And uh, uh, the victims do not want to speak about that. And while the society has not changed this, attitude while maybe next generation my children that they grow with this understanding that these people are innocent this is something that needs to be taught so and until then it is only representatives of these people who can talk women themselves they very rarely agree to speak because their experience is devalued and this transformed into something negative Thank you. I mean, yeah, we do have a webinar even on I'm, children on children born of rape, uh, both from Rwanda and Bosnia. Yes, unfortunately, that's an issue as well. So I believe that people who are ready to speak about that, at least those us those who represent them, we need to keep speaking about that until the society starts uh, hearing the word rape, not as something offensive, but as a um, crime of <laughs> war, normal for the war. It's nothing normal in the war, but I mean that the war is often accompanied by this phenomena. And uh, that when we hear the word rape, at the word that we do not stay aside, but we want to help these people. And I believe that the only way... You are, you are disappearing. I believe that the only way to do that is to keep going back to this question. And uh, it is important that those people who can speak about that, that they speak about that and that they are sincere. Thank you. Gilbert, uh, uh, uh... Rabbi, can you let Gilbert in? But Gilbert, not all of it. Yeah, you you've been you have a long longish question. Make it shorter, please. Gilbert is a filmmaker from Rwanda, and we know each other for many years. Go ahead, Gilbert. You have the floor. Unmute yourself. come on okay am i here yes okay um first of all i want to um i i'm very emotional when it comes to survivors when they're speaking are you guys there hello yes 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 please go on. yes yes um and um, I listened to uh, my um, my colleague um, Ahmed Amin. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question for him. Um, the yeah. question is about transfer of trauma. Yeah. How does it occur? Um, I believe there cannot be any transfer of physical wound, but psychological wounds can happen through socialization, sometimes anxiety. Um, it was a great presentation to see uh, a couple of examples on how it happens. Um, now, that's the question number one, transfer of trauma. Uh, second question would be proud to be a survivor. What are we proud of? I am a survivor of a genocide survivor. I'm a genocide survivor um, from Rwanda, um, 1994. What am I proud of? To be alive or not to be dead? Uh, what, give, what gives a meaning to be alive? So um, this goes to, again, to what uh, Perez uh, presented about, uh, the situation in Spain, uh, the refusal of importance of justice and other things, realities, uh, absence and achievement of justice, which is something you discuss in your book, 
um, if I remember correctly, you keep on saying, no, it's not 42 ways of <laughs> stopping a, a survival of genocide to speak. Um, um, then thank I you. also- Thank you, Gilbert, it, please make it shorter so other people can also participate. Okay, on the question of rape. Um, when that situation happens, it's violent, um, not only on the body, but also in the language and everything else. And then a child is born. What happened to that child? Um, that is a question that has to be investigated. I happen to know a couple of cases um, and um, um, there have been reconciliation, okay? Um, let's say I raped you and then this is my child and the war ended and that's it. But the question is, what does the child feel? Does the child stay in the history of violence, like mentally, psychologically, and all that? Or does this Gilbert, Gilbert, let me stop you because we have a, a full webinar on just that. Thank you. Please, it's on our website. If it, please, dear, dear audience, we create all these webinars for all of you to learn from and to participate with us. Uh, so please, uh, this is exactly, this will happen with this webinar too. You'll be able to listen to it again and again and learn from it and think some more. Let me add just one more question to to all of you that uh, that Peter Polatin is asking about testimonial therapy. So, uh, Ahmed, please, would you address some of the questions that yeah. Gilbert you, asked? Thank you, Gilbert, uh, and everybody else too. Please, a quick uh, answer to Gilbert. Thank you so much, Gilbert. These are very nice and great question actually regarding the transparency there are several theories talking about that i just brought two that one talk about biological the other on socialization and you are correct mostly it's the psychosocial transference however do not forget we do not forget that some survivors are becoming aggressive because of the way that he or he has been treated and he's treating his kids same as that. That's why we might see uh, the children of survivors, they have been beaten, they have been broken hands, broken heads. Why? Because the father is become aggressive physical, uh, physical uh, aspect as well. When that's the, 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 the answer to that question. But yes, you are correct, mostly psychosocial. Um, when it comes to proud, how to be proud, we hear from the Suleiman story. After coming out from the prison in Iraq, there are several political parties. They form their what's called political uh, 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 prison association. So members of those associations feel that they have sacrificed their lives. That's why they have been jailed and tortured. And that's why they are saying, we are proud we have been jailed and tortured because we done it for a purpose. For, for our nation, even if they torture us, we survive the torture and we done it for uh, uh, an aim. And that's why uh, when I said proud, not because they have been tortured, because they have been tortured for an aim, for an objective. Uh, thank you, Gilbert, thank you so much. Yeah, and, and uh, let me also share with you that there is, uh, and to you, Gilbert, and to everyone, there is a special version of the Daniele inventory that was that we worked on for months on Rwanda in particular. Uh, and it includes a special section for children born of rape. And it's going to, and we are working on implementing it and actually testing it. I hope we will do the same POW for Spain. 
because there's been very little scientific, because of the silence, there's been very little scientific work that would, it, it, it was almost like you're supposed to be, by law, you're supposed to be quiet so you can't ask questions. So uh, so that's very important. And so, certainly, I know, Oksana, that we will, we are working on a version for Ukraine. And Ahmed, it, it does exist in Arabic, except it needs to be adjusted in terms of the, uh, the authentic particular history, but, which is another thing we should do as the center for which all of you are, are, belong, really. Uh, you know, maybe that will be another book that we will show decision makers that this happens all over the world you cannot stop looking you cannot pretend like it doesn't exist you cannot pretend that it exists only in banana republic as as you said pal um oh my uh i i have the feeling we need to continue in this particular webinar <laughs> So we will continue to correspond to see, in fact, how we put this particular webinar, how to put it forward to the next step. Any ideas for last word right now? What do you, what's the message? Uh, I feel just to all, to the Ukrainians, there's been extremely active chat in Ukrainian. Of course, only you can read the, the chat messages. Uh, I wonder if, if the interpreters want to maybe summarize them or maybe Oksana, you can summarize some of the comments. Uh, or it's okay to leave it within the Ukrainian community. Mostly Ukrainians are writing in English there. And what's in Ukrainian, let me check. Well, a psychologist who works in a charitable foundation uh, contributes. And uh, what she says is true that women are ready to accept social assistance like clothes and uh, medicines, even undergo medical exams. But in Ukrainian society, we have the fear of this uh, root word psycho. I mean, psychologist is not associated with uh, like how, but uh, people are afraid that they would find themselves in a madhouse. So they, uh, and uh, people often ridicule uh, those people who are in mental clinics, patients of mental clinics. And they say, tell to psychologists, we are fine. We don't want to go there. Same about the military. They have this official examination that they, where they need to, I have consultations, uh, counseling sessions with psychologists, but they also tell their psychologists or psychiatrists that we are fine, we are great. And then in the morning you go to talk to the nurses and uh, you hear what they discuss uh, um, informally and you understand that people are having very severe, very serious problems. And then you have to explain it to them that you're going to work with psychologists and that's nothing terrible. You explain that that's normal. You try to showcase that this is normal to, to, to talk to a psychologist, to a psychotherapist. Maybe then they would be ready to open a little bit more, to open up. And there you need to find a way to communicate with them in a comfortable way because it has always been um, devalued and hushed down these issues. And uh, I even wrote here in the chat that I am fine being an orthopedist traumatologist because I have my basic skills and I have my technical work. But when I talk to patients as a traumatologist, it is easier for them to open up to talk about their problems to me as a traumatologist than to a psychologist. Stigmas, so, stigmas, stigmas, stigmas. That's another source of silence. <laughs> 
So we have two stigmas. We have enough stigmas to right. Yes, you have to cheat on them. You have to deal with them as with young children. And yes, yeah, stigma, this is what people are writing about in the chat and about the recording. I believe recording will be available, right? And part of the stigma results in these services being pro bono. It's like, why should psychological services be pro bono? I also had the question about the hospital and psychological services. Maybe for victims, they should be uh, free of charge. I agree with that, but they must be funded by the government or donors and IFIs or local donors. Our uh, hospital is fully funded uh, from donations and uh, in international grants. So there's a lot of education to do. Ah, and that's the other, the other layer, right? Because we spoke about services, we talked about history, we spoke about justice, and we and there was a mention of commemorations, etc. But part of our hugest uh, task is education, education, education. Ah. Uh, so we continue. Uh, I, we ask people, uh, I, I, we promise last words. Why won't we start from Jacob and go back? Jacob, what's your last message to the audience, uh, uh, to, uh, to today's audience? And speak to us, please, not sideways. It's hard to hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. It's, it's a good experience to share uh, this platform with so many uh, people who have great experience. Uh, that's my first time today on the webinar. And I learned a lot from uh, different uh, places. Uh, you could understand that uh, people with trauma could go with a similar uh, a similarity situation so all around the world what we could do is just to see how to fight against this uh traumatic situation to help people with uh trauma and it's it is important to work together as a, a team to fight uh, this situation thank you so much very good so pow you're next Thank you. Um, well, I'm really impressed by all the testimonies I heard in this afternoon. And uh, as you said, uh, so much suffering and uh, so much histories of silence. And I think that, um, well, we said that, that truth heals, um, also justice heals, and impunity damages persons and society. And I think hearing uh, all my colleagues that uh, there is uh, sometimes a pressure to forgive, thinking that forgiveness is somehow um, a higher value and victims should commit to, uh, to forgiveness. But forgiveness in fact is a privilege of the victim. It's not a duty, it's a privilege of the victim. And uh, um, to forgive is necessary to ask to, to recognize the wrongdoings. And this is something that, that it's not done. I don't think in Kurdistan it's not done. It's not done in Ukraine. It's not done. So uh, uh, first we need to, uh, to make a basic agreement on what happened. And then this opens doors for forgiveness. And of course, uh, for trying to look together to the future. And this connects with education and all the important things you were saying. Ahmed? Uh, maybe one thing that as professional, uh, some, sometimes we will be overwhelmed also with the, with the trauma exists all over the world. But please, let's still 
have the hope in ourselves that providing our service to even one individual, it means providing it to a family, decreasing suffering for a family, for the society. And it could lead, that's why, again, I'm, it could lead to decreasing suffering to next generation as well. You know, this is, this is, this gives me comfort as a Jewish person, because in Judaism, we believe when you help one person, you help the whole world. And so when you help one, then another, and then at least you feel something, a little comfort that you have. <laughs> and this is the slogan, the slogan for my foundation, what you say. Oh, really? That is a basic Jewish belief. You didn't even know you were Jewish. So, Oksana, take me a member of your foundation. <laughs> yeah, maybe I have that in my ancestry. <laughs> that Wishing is you all my success. So, I, I do want to share with people that our upcoming next webinar on July uh, 10 is on the re release of prisoners in Rwanda. You know, prisoners have been served in prisons for over 20 years and they are now being released back to their families and communities. So that creates another challenge, many challenges. So we'll have a webinar on that. Then on those of you who are interested, particularly in justice, uh, well, it's also aspect of justice. On the, you know, July 17 is the International Day of Justice. So on July 14, before the big events at the UN, we will have a webinar on the, the, the provisions for justice for victims in particular in the International Criminal Court, which are the most uh, advanced provisions, but for us to examine whether they have worked in the last 25 years. And please join us because you have a lot to say. <laughs> about the next 25 years. Uh, and then we go back to Bosnia on the 24th of Ju July and on and on. Please stay with us. Uh, um, yeah, we belong together and we, ha we also have to remain supporting of each other's work. Uh, so that is part of the center. So I feel like crying a little bit. If somebody else does, please do. And, and, and here's a hug. It's, it's, we raised very rough issues and we live in a rough world. Um, but we are here for each other, so let's continue.